Hi, good afternoon, or whenever you're watching this. Thanks for coming to this webinar. We're going to be talking today on disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, fix, future, or fad. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Terry Lee. I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I'm also a faculty member at the Evidence-Based Practice Institute. Um, this is my contact information. So this is what we'll be talking about today. Um, as a result of attending this webinar, you'll be able to explain the problem, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, or DMDD, was created to fix. Um, so this is the fix part. Um, describe the evolution of the DMDD diagnosis and current research. So this is the future. And cite some controversies surrounding the DM, uh, DMDD as a diagnosis. So this is the fad. Well, in starting, we have to go back to the diagnosis of bipolar disorder in kids. So bipolar disorder, as you may know, is the DSM diagnosis. It's also known as manic depressive illness. So it's characterized by mood episodes, so highs, mania, and lows, depression. And these episodes are a change from baseline. So on our mood graph here, we have uh, someone, uh, someone's moods with bipolar disorder or actually let's start with um, someone with no mood disorder. So th this is like average mood. You, you might have some highs. Uh, you might go back to baseline. You might have some lows. Go back to baseline. So, so you have some ups and downs as far as your mood. But they don't go too high or too low, and, and, and when they get high or low, they, they don't uh, persistently stay high. This is contrasted with someone with bipolar disorder. They have episodes of mania with highs, a very elevated mood, which and persists over days or weeks, uh, and then a return to baseline, which is also called euthymia, so a typical mood. And then episodes of depression, which can last for, again, uh, weeks at a time, and uh, additional episodes of depression. Now, in less than a 10-year period of time in the United States, there was a 40-fold increase, a 4-0, a 40-fold increase in the diagnosis of kids diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Wow. Incredible, huh? So this is what it looks like in kids. So this is um, 1994 to 95, uh, a 40-fold increase up to, whoops, up to 2002, 2003. Uh, now, some of the things as well, there's nearly a doubling of the diagnosis of bipolar disorder in adults in the United States. So yeah, there was some loosening around the application of the criteria of bipolar disorder in both adults and kids, but really a very marked change um, increase in, in kids. So how did this happen? Well, there were a few but very influential researchers proposed that bipolar disorder might be different and present differently in adults versus kids and that um, some symptoms that might uh, be equivalents of highs and lows, manic and depressive episodes, or rapid cycling might be frequent temper tantrums or chronic non-episodic irritability. So uh, remember these two uh, symptom clusters that I'm talking about, temper tantrums and irritability, because they'll come into play later. So just to give you an idea, uh, here's one of the earlier papers that was published on childhood bipolar disorder. Uh, this was a group out of uh, Harvard, Massachusetts General, um, 1995. So it wasn't a large number of kids, 43 kids, that seemed to meet criteria for how, um, or at least as they were applied in Mass at Massachusetts General, um, they seemed to meet criteria for mania. But if you look at these 43 kids, uh, they, they found that almost all of them had ADHD. So 42 out of 43 had ADHD. And then this gets interesting too, that um, the average onset of manic symptoms was at 5.4 years of age. It's pretty young, right? <laughs> and 70% of the parents reported the age of onset of symptoms, or the parents as interpreted by the people administering the instrument, um, about 
reported the age of onset was less than five years old. So that's a little unusual. That's, that's pretty early because most people consider bipolar disorder or mania as having onset sometime af, you know, uh, around puberty or, or after the onset of puberty. So th this was really quite a jump to say that kids under the age of five were presenting with manic symptoms or bipolar disorder. And then uh, most of the kids, again, had mixed episodes, so uh, highs and lows within the same day. This was the other group um, of this is the other group of researchers that were proposing that there were a lot of kids in the United States with bipolar disorder. So this is the Washington University group. Um, they looked at uh, kids from, or they found 86 kids that they felt met criteria for bipolar disorder. Um, again, like the Mass General group, the Washington University group found that almost all the kids with bipolar disorder had ADHD, um, high rates of irritability. Again, keep in mind the irritability and the, the mixed mania and rapid cycling. Um, they had age of onset at 7.4 years, so not quite as young as five, but still well before puberty, which again, most people accept that's when you start seeing kids with bipolar disorder. And they had long mood episodes, like more than a year of, of this rapid cycling or again, chronic non-episodic irritability. So to summarize, um, the kids being diagnosed with bipolar disorder in the United States did not, or did not meet usual criteria for bipolar disorder. They may not have may not have had episodes of mania, may not have had episodes of depression, um, but they did have late bowel mood with a lot of problems with psychosocial functioning, and. Uh, the kids being diagnosed with bipolar disorder in the United States had the age of onset of symptoms in early elementary school or even in preschool. So just to go back to our mood graph, if this is how um, we think of manic depressive illness as being typically diagnosed, uh, there were kids maybe having ups and downs in, in chronic cycling or rapid cycling. Uh, maybe these kids had something like bipolar disorder, at least as proposed by these two groups of researchers, and, and there were others as well, but the, the, the research came, um, as far as characterizing these kids, the research, a lot of it came from these two sites. Well, I talked about this as um, being an American phenomenon. How, how, was, how was this being viewed in other countries, or, or how, how many other mental health providers in other countries were seeing kids with childhood onset, pre-adolescent onset bipolar disorder. Well, uh, if you looked in the United Kingdom, uh, it was not very common to have kids uh, under the age of 10 with bipolar disorder. And when you looked at kids of all ages, discharging from inpatient psychiatric units, United Kingdom versus the United States, bipolar disorder is way more was, was way more prevalent in the United States than the United Kingdom. These are some other European countries that, again, didn't uh, really see a lot of uh, kids of any age with bipolar disorder, much less pre-adolescents with bipolar disorder. And then in looking at other countries, um, really pre-adolescent bipolar disorder uh, was either non-existent or rare, or actually is non-existent or rare, in these countries, Australia, Brazil, China, India, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Russia, Turkey. Um, and then there was subsequent research in the United States that found that um, the kids diagnosed with bipolar disorder don't respond to the mood stab stabilizer medications that are effective for most kids or most adults with bipolar disorder. Um, and when they followed the kids being diagnosed with bipolar disorder, uh, from an early age to adulthood, the kids that were diagnosed with bipolar disorder in elementary school or beyond did not grow up to have bipolar disorder as we know it in adults. So, you know, something <laughs> is not going well here for the diagnosis of bipolar disorder in kids. Um, so there were a group of researchers at the National Institute for Mental Health 
that developed a research construct called severe mood dysregulation. So they they came up with this con construct to differentiate it from bipolar disorder. Since so, again, there was emerging evidence that the kids being diagnosed with bipolar disorder um, did not actually have bipolar disorder, uh, but this wasn't to say that these kids didn't have high behavioral health needs. So the severe mood dysregulation or SMD criteria involved uh, persistent non-episodic irritability, dysphoric mood, frequent anger outbursts, so and the irritability with the temper tantrums, and symptoms of hyperarousal, which come from uh, like DSM uh, mania symptoms. So more specifically, uh, these were the criteria that were proposed by the NIMH group. Um, and so again, this was really more for, for their research and trying to understand uh, who these kids were that, um, that had chronic non-episodic irritability and uh, temper tantrums. So the criteria are a little complicated, as you'll see. Um, so abnormal mood, anger or sadness, more than half the day, most days. Hyperarousal, so this is insomnia, agitation, distractibility, racing thoughts, flight of ideas, pressured speech, and intrusiveness. So again, these, are, uh, these come from like manic-like symptoms. Uh, increased reactivity to negative emotional stimuli, uh, at least two times a week for the last four weeks. And the symptoms are present for at least 12 months without any period without symptoms um, greater than two months. And the symptoms are present in at least two settings um, and are severe in at least one setting. So based on that, um, the DSM-5 work group looking at, um, well, bipolar disorder and mood dysregulation and emotion dysregulation um, proposed this disorder called Temper dysregulation with dysphoria, TDD. So this was a proposal. It was based on severe mood dysregulation, but uh, had different criteria, slightly different criteria. And it was proposed to address the inappropriate diagnosis of bipolar disorder in the United States, uh, specifically uh, for children. The idea was that it would provide a diagnostic home for kids with chronic non-episodic irritability. Uh, so again, instead of diagnosing kids with bipolar disorder when they had chronic non-episodic irritability or temper tantrums, they would be diagnosed with TDD. Um, so this was controversial for, for a lot of reasons, um, starting with the fact that there was no research on temper dysregulation with dysphoria when it was proposed as a diagnosis. And the diagnosis on which it was based, SMD, uh, had only a handful of studies on researchers at the National Institute for Mental Health. Now, this is contrasted with, say, something like binge eating disorder. You may uh, have seen that um, binge eating disorder was also adopted in DSM-5. Uh, however, uh, binge eating disorder had over 20 years of research with uh, over a 1,000 research papers before it was adopted in its final form into DSM-5. And, and there were a number of child psychiatrists speaking up at this time saying, well, do we do you really want to do this? Is, is this a good idea? Are, are there some other ways to, to address the issue of the inappropriate diagnosis of bipolar disorder in kids? Um, and in fact, the, the diagnosis of bipolar disorder was tightened up by uh, highlighting that bipolar disorder is a mood disorder that is episodic. So, so the mood episodes have a beginning and an end, and they're a change from baseline. Uh, this, so again, this, this really contrasts it from, from chronic non-episodic irritability. Um, and, and there were other ways uh, proposed to address the kids with uh, dysphoria or uh, severe irritability or, or negative, um, negative emotional reactivity. But be that as it may, uh, in fact, Destructive mood dysregulation disorder was adopted in DSM-5. That's why we're having this talk. So these are the criteria for DSM-5. Um, again, they're, they're pretty complicated. So like criterion A, severe recurrent temper outbursts manifested verbally and or behaviorally that are grossly out of proportion in intensity or duration to the situation or provocation. So again, this is um, not only complicated, but, but there's, you know, a bit of subjectivity associated with it, saying, well, what's grossly out of proportion? 
an intensity or duration to the situation of provocation. Similarly, temporary outbursts are inconsistent with developmental level. Uh, certainly severe temporary outbursts, um, maybe we'd all agree that that they're inconsistent with developmental level, but you know, um, there's, there's some level of sub subjectivity. And if you have parents reporting on these symptoms, then you know they they may not have um, a good baseline to compare it to. Um, occurs at least three times a week on average. Uh, the mood between outbursts is, is persistently irritable or angry most of the day, nearly every day, and is observable to others. Um, the symptoms have to have been present for over 12 months and not absent for more than three months. Um, they, incur, they occur at least in two settings and severe in at least one. The diagnosis shouldn't be made for the first time before age six or after 18 years. Um, the age of onset of symptoms is before 10 years. And there are no manic symptoms. And the behaviors don't occur exclusively during a major depressive episode. As far as other rules for DMDD and DSM, uh, under the rules of DSM-5, DMDD can't occur uh, with oppositional defined disorder or intermittent explosive disorder. So if, if kids meet criteria for both, uh, DMDD and ODD, they should be diagnosed with DMDD only. Uh, it also can't occur with bipolar, co occur with bipolar disorder. So if a kid meets criteria for both bipolar disorder and DMDD, the kid should be diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Um, however, DMDD can occur with ADHD and MDD. So again, a little complicated, but these are um, sometimes. Um, rules put into DSM j just to, um, well, just to help with clarifying diagnoses, but it can sometimes, I think, cause confusion. As far as controversies then, um, there were a number of them. So again, there was no research on DMDD when it was proposed as a diagnosis. Uh, based on severe mood dysregulation, um, I'm sorry, it was based on severe mood dysregulation, but without the hyperarousal criteria. And again, the research on SMD was limited when it was proposed. And people question, was there a need for a diagnostic home for DMDD? Could, could the existing DSM criteria and disorders be tweaked in some ways um, to better characterize these kids? Um, what are the consequences for creating a diagnosis before we've researched it well? And again, how is the rest of the world dealing with this? So as far as DMDD research, it's, it's very limited. Um, it mostly involves severe mood dysregulation or modified DMDD criteria often applied retrospectively on um, like, like data sets of, uh, of uh, symptoms and uh, uh, structured interviews. So one question has to do with DMDD diagnostic reliability. So again, this would be typically something that you look at when you make a new diagnosis or propose a new diagnosis. How often can people uh, agree on the diagnosis? So these were actual DMDD criteria that were used in the DSM-5 criteria, uh, DSM-5 field trials. So you see the inter-rate reliability in inpatient settings was 0.49, which isn't great. Um, but when you looked at the outpatient settings, it was 0.06 to 0.11, which is, is really uh, unacceptable. I mean, there's, there's, there's not much agreement at all among providers or uh, assessors as to which kids have DMDD and which kids don't. So that's, that's a big problem, that, that there's not agreement among clinicians on which kids have DMDD when they're trying to use the criteria. As a result of this, we also don't know, like, like what is the base rate of DMDD? Is it a common diagnosis? Uh, how how often would you expect to see it in the general population of kids? Um, again, not, not really well known. Um, and then in one study, looking at um, how parents endorse symptoms versus hospital staff endorse symptoms for the same kid, uh, parents in general endorsed symptoms of DMDD twice as frequently as the hospital staff. Again, that is what we were talking about before around subjectivity or uh, differences in baseline regarding um, how, how inappropriate the, 
the um, the emotional reactivity is, or, or the the, um, the 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 dysphoric mood in response to to negative um, in response to to a stimulus or a negative response to a stimulus. So another question would be, is the MDD a distinct diagnosis? So here is it like a diagnosis where there's some kids who only have DMDD, whoops, only have DMDD, um, you know, that there may, there may be some comorbidity. There's a lot of, in child psychiatry, there, there are a few disorders where um, kids only, or most kids have more than one disorder, but, but there will be kids that have only one disorder, like the, there will be some kids who only have ADHD uh, or kids who only have depression or anxiety, but yeah, and often in child psychiatry, a kid with depression uh, is going to have anxiety. But, but are there some kids who have only DMDD? Or is it uh, something like this where, well, uh, kids with DMDD have other types of disorders and symptoms and, and they don't often present with DMDD alone? Well, so here are some studies looking at that question. How often is DMDD a distinct diagnosis? So in this first bullet, you see that um, in this study, uh, they found that about 60% of kids with DMDD had either an emotional disorder, that's like anxiety, depression, or a behavioral disorder like oppositional defiant disorder or ADHD. So uh, about 60% of kids in this study had some other disorder, meaning that about 40% you know, of kids had only DMDD. There's another study looking at three different community samples, and here um, there were higher rates of comorbidity. So anywhere from 60 to over 90% of kids with DMDD had some other psychiatric disorder. So 92%, that's a lot, meaning only 8% of the kids with DMDD didn't have some other disorder. And then th they also looked at kids with both an emotional disorder and a behavioral disorder. So again, a, an emotional disorder like depression or anxiety and a behavioral disorder like conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder. And they found that uh, in, in this sample, or these samples, uh, anywhere from a third to two thirds of kids had both an emotional disorder and a behavioral disorder. Um, here's another study, the National Comorbidity Survey. They found that uh, of the kids diagnosed or meeting criteria for DMDD, uh, over 90% of the kids met criteria for some other disorder. Um, so again, not a lot of kids with DMDD only. There's another study looking at kids with DMDD and they found that 92% of the kids met criteria for ODD, oppositional defined disorder. Keep in mind again that the rules of um, DSM uh, prevent kids from being diagnosed with DMDD and oppositional defined disorder. Uh, however, the, this does raise the question of, uh, well, one question of, is DMDD uh, like a subpopulation of kids with oppositional defined disorder? Um, so again, that's a question. Uh, and then the longitudinal assessment of manic symptom study um, found that um, of the kids diagnosed with the meeting criteria for DMDD, again, uh, almost all of them met criteria for, for either oppositional defined disorder or conduct disorder. So that's, that's, that's quite a bit of kids then uh, with disruptive mood dysregulation disorder that, that, uh, that also have, you know, would meet criteria if not for the rules of DSM. They, they would meet criteria for oppositional defined disorder. So I showed you the other Venn diagrams. Here's a Venn diagram from the LAM study. So um, of the kids with DMDD, then 184 kids in the study met criteria for DMDD. Only four of the 184 kids with DMDD did not have attention deficit or oppositional defined disorder or conduct disorder. Again, this raises questions about the validity of the diagnosis, or uh, even sh should we be classifying this in a different way, more related to disruptive behavior disorders versus um, uh, mood disorders. In, in fact, in DSM-5, DMDD is classified with the mood disorders, the, the depressive disorders, rather than the disruptive behavior disorders. Um, how stable is the diagnosis? So again, this is like uh, more of the preliminary um, research that would be done when you propose a new diagnosis. If someone has the diagnosis at point A, uh, how often would you expect them to have the diagnosis at point B? 
some of the LAMP study. This was a study uh, where kids were assessed um, at one point, and then there was follow-up one year later, and follow-up um, one year after that. So, so there were three assessments, uh, one at point zero, one at one year, one at two years. So of the kids that met criteria for DMDD, only 19% of those kids met criteria at all three assessments um, that, that were two years apart total. Um, and then here was a prospective study with the uh, NIMH study group. They, they identified 200 kids that met criteria for SMD, severe mood dysregulation, and at four-year follow-up, only 40% met criteria for SMD. So, um, and, and certainly for, for SMD, the, uh, the kids meeting criteria have, have decreased over time, and, and that's also true of DMDD in the, in the, the studies done so far, the, the, the rate seems to go down with age. Um, other associations with DMDD, well, there are high levels, as, as you might guess, it, there would be high levels of psychosocial impairment. A lot of these kids are involved with treatment and services. It's also associated with poverty and parental behavioral health concerns, so parental mental health and substance use concerns. And as far as long-term outcomes, uh, kids diagnosed with DMDD have adverse health outcomes. Um, uh, they're likely to have low income, uh, police contact, and low educational attainment. Now, these are fairly non-specific findings. And in fact, every bullet that I have on this slide um, would also be highly associated with kids involved with the foster care system. So the fact that, again, this is associated with DMDD doesn't, I mean, it gives us concern for helping these kids and trying to find effective treatments for these kids, but it, it it doesn't necessarily mean that that, uh, that at least the evidence on this slide points to DMDD as a diagnosis or supports DMDD as a diagnosis. Um, as far as irritability research, uh, these are some other cognitive behavioral findings um, and some neuroimaging findings um, for for the group with group of kids with chronic irritability. So there, there, there's increased vulnerability to frustration. They respond differently to punishment, so they're not as sensitive to punishment. Um, and by punishment, uh, th these are just um, more like neural psychological constructs, right? Uh, of uh, like um, not not getting points on on a task or or a um, an activity that they're participating in. Uh, this type of punishment. Um, there's greater emotional reactivity. Um, decreased emotion regulation, and differences in attention and distraction. And all these kind of behavioral differences are associated with differences in neuroimaging studies. As far as mental health outcomes for kids with chronic non-episodic irritability, um, the kids with severe irritabil irritabilities uh, don't grow up to have bipolar disorder. They actually most often present later in life with depression, disruptive behavior, and anxiety disorders. As far as treatment of DMDD, as you might guess, uh, there's very limited research on psychosocial interventions and medication treatments. The most promising psychosocial interventions are those effective for disruptive behavior. So th these would be things like parent management training, um, youth skills training, like um, emotion regulation, skills training, interpersonal skills, and problem-solving skills, um, cognitive behavioral approaches, and intensive family-based treatments. So what's the impact of this new DMDD diagnosis? It's really too early to say. Um, the diagnosis hasn't been used much. It's not clear, like, uh, I mean, certainly, if the criteria are applied the way they're, you know, like, the way they're written, um, most studies have shown that not many kids will meet criteria. Um, and then I think clinicians are still assessing the usefulness of the diagnosis. Since it doesn't change what we do at this point, I think not, some clinicians don't, don't think about diagnosing kids with it because, um, you know, it, it just would raise more questions. 
um, understandable questions from families, like, well, if my kid has this, then what should we do? And the research would, again, would not necessarily suggest anything different than um, uh, what, what, what a good assessment of other disorders would, would suggest. So, you know, if a kid meets criteria for other psychiatric diagnoses that respond to medications, you would uh, prescribe those medications, but there are no specific medications that, that have been shown to help disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. And similarly, that there haven't been any specific psychosocial interventions developed for DMDD, but as we said previously, the, the treatments for kids with disruptive behavior disorder would, would be the most promising. Um, I, I think there are concerns like, well, are, are there other negative impacts? And like, uh, are, are we being distracted by this diagnosis? Um, and again, I, I don't see the diagnosis as being used that much. And, and when I talk to families that have had a kid diagnosed with DMDD, I'll ask them, well, what, what, what do you know about it? And, and what do you understand what you're supposed to do? And the families typically say something like, well, we were told it's not clear what we should do and that the, the treatment should involve things like addressing behavior on the part of the kid. Um, but that, that would be the concern that uh, say a kid had some treatable illness like uh, PTSD or depression or ADHD, uh, would, would we be distracted by the diagnosis of DMDD and not treat these other disorders that, that have effective treatments? Uh, again, I'm, I'm not um, seeing a lot of that either, and I've not heard of a lot of that, but that, that is a concern that's been expressed. Um, as far as other ways of dealing with irritability, uh, again, even before, um, or yeah, even before DMDD was adopted, there were other suggestions to address um, kids with chronic non-episodic irritability and or temper tantrums. So given that there are high rates of comorbidity with opposition defiant disorder, and if you go back to the bipolar studies, ADHD, like 85, 95% of kids meeting criteria uh, for one or the other, um, could, could, could we come up with a subcategory of uh, ODD and or ADHD with say irritability or uh, emotional dysregulation, you know, or, or severe ODHD, you know, ODD or something like that. Um, also, th there have been uh, suggestions to add modifiers like uh, ODD with emotion dysregulation or ADHD with impulsive aggression. So th these are other suggestions that, that were made um, and are still, I think, uh, being discussed. And how's the rest of the world dealing with this? Well, the largest healthcare classification system in the world is the International Classification of Disease, which is managed by the World Health Organization. And so their working group on uh, behavior disorders looked at the research on DMD, considered, well, should, should we add this as a diagnosis? And they considered that and, and in fact rejected it uh, for ICD 11, which is the the upcoming version of the, or yeah, the the ICD. So in summary, um, DMDD started as a diagnosis, um, in part and mostly to stop American psychiatrists from inappropriately diagnosing youth with bipolar disorder. Um, there was limited research on DMDD when it was proposed as a diagnosis. There's low inter-rater reliability when making the diagnosis. It seldom occurs as a single diagnosis and is often uh, occurring with other conditions. Um, it's difficult to differentiate from ODD and conduct disorder. And kids presenting for behavioral health treatment, so kids in clinics presenting for help with depression or anxiety or disruptive behavior disorder often meet criteria for DMDD. And there's limited research on treatment. So the destructive behavior treatments are the most promising. And regardless of what the kids actually have, the kids being diagnosed with disruptive mood dysregulation disorder and bipolar disorder have high behavioral health needs. So that concludes our presentation today. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, this is my contact if you have any questions. Thanks.